0.1.5, that's the big winner this month. All right, let's talk about seasonal diseases. And hey, there's no seasonal disease like the flu. And when we're looking at the flu, <laughs> wow. Uh, what I did is I grabbed the, the flu picture from this year, and you can see New Mexico is our hotspot for the flu. It was a cold spot for COVID, but it's a, it's a hot spot for the flu, has the highest activity level for flu. Also, New York City and the District of Columbia are hot spots as well. But the rest of the country, eh, it's pretty calm. Uh, when we look at the flu 2021 and 2022, we could see Georgia was the hot spot. Texas was warm and the rest of the country rather cool. But for this year, looks like New Mexico. They're the winners, I guess we could call it that. So Dr. Tony Fauci, Anthony Fauci, uh, the ex-NIAD chief, is telling the vaccine truth. It's not that we're saying he was uh, not telling the truth before, but let's call it a better clarification, okay? Um, admitted to that his critics were right about the mucosal immunity being necessary for maximal response for respiratory viruses. This systemic immunity, we're, and we're talking, you know, getting the shot in the arm versus mucosal immunity, you know, on the nasal passages or throat. So systemic immunity through intermuscular injection has never provided optimal immunity for most respiratory viral pathogens. Is that a surprise? No, right? Look at flu. Flu, we never have gotten more than really 50 to 52 percent uh, efficacy out of the flu shot just because it's an intermuscular injection and it's the mucosal protection is what we're really looking for. So uh, Dr. Pauci said it's not surprising that none of the predominantly mucosal respiratory viruses have ever been effective, effectively controlled by vaccines. That's right. Flu's not. We don't even have a cold vaccine and other respiratory as well as COVID. However, all of it's not lost because I pulled this up from The Lancet and it says that previous natural infection was associated with a lower incidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection, regardless of the variant, than mRNA primary series vaccination. Vaccination remains the safest and most optimal tool for protecting against infection infection and COVID related hospitalization and death, irrespective of your previous vaccine status. That is what I think we all are hanging on to, is the fact that no, we're not stopping the spread of the disease. I think most of us never believed that we would be doing that, but the truth is it's keeping people from getting extremely sick or people from getting into the hospital. So, Here's your question. If I am shots work for MMR, MMR spread by respiratory droplets, right? Uh, mumps, measles, and rubella are all spread by respiratory droplets. Why do we have a vaccine that we can give you a one shot? And now they're saying do a booster if, if you're a certain age, but one shot and boom, you're done. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons for it. Let's go through them. Let's let's take this apart. This is fascinating stuff. I was talking to uh, a couple pharmacists today. Uh, today was my clinic day, and I was talking to them about this, and they, they were, wow, this is really cool stuff. So the incubation period is, is the big variant, okay? The incubation period for the flu is one to four days. For RSV, it's two to eight. Rhinovirus, it's two plus, and COVID, it's two plus, up to 10 days. So several characteristics enable COVID, RSV, flu, and the common cold to cause repeated infections. How do they do it? Well, they all have short incubation periods. Now, when we look at the incubation periods, say, of uh, the, the respiratory viruses, flu, RSV, rhinovirus, and COVID, and we compare them to mumps, measles, and rubella, significant, you know, there are the mumps, measles, and rubella are, you know, five to eight times longer incubation periods than flu, RSV, rhinovirus, as well as COVID. So mumps, 16 to 18 days incubation period. Measles, 11 to 12 days incubation period. Rubella, 12 to 23 days. So what does that mean? It's, it's in your body. It's multiplying like crazy. So your body is building up a solid immunity to it before it spreads and goes away. Uh, potential for mutation, COVID and influenza, and all those Omicron variants I just shared with you a couple slides ago. 
shows you amazingly how quick COVID mutates. Influenza mutates. We got to do a new shot every year. Obviously, mutation. Rapid host-to-host -host transmission and replication in the nasal mucosa rather than throughout the body. And this last feature, that replication inside our bodies versus just the nasal mucosa, uh, the last feature, non-systemic replication, means these viruses they don't stimulate the full force of the adaptive immune system. Remember your T cells, your B cells, and all that immunology that you learn? That's what we're keying in on. You get a much bigger response from mumps, measles, and rubella. And it takes typically a week or more to mount, but you look at that incubation period, one to four, two days, two plus, two plus days. Hey, it's no wonder these guys can mutate and they can spread quickly and they really don't give us a solid immune response. All right, so we beat up COVID again. Yes, we did beat up uh, flu. And now it's time for us. This is the highlight of today's program. I am just delighted to introduce to you Dr. William Eggleston. Willie Eggleston is a clinical assistant professor at Binghamton University. He holds a doctor of pharmacy degree from Wilkes University. He also completed a fellowship in clinical toxicology and emergency medicine. Willie previously worked as an assistant professor at State University of New York, Upstate Medical University, as a clinical toxicologist, at, as well as at the Upstate New York Poison Center. He's now the director, and this is why we drug him in here, kicking and screaming. Uh, he is the executive director on the executive board of the New York State Chapter of American College of Clinical Pharmacy, and he's the director of the Opioid Research Center of Central New York. Now, there's a lot of smart guys around here that, that, that know a lot about opioids, but what really excites me about him is he's looking at the mental health aspects as well as the stigma. You're in for a treat. Dr. Wally Eggleston, welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. Okay, so we're going to get right to the hard questions. Uh, topic number one, stigma. This is a big one. Overcoming stigma in the community. How do we overcome stigma in the profession? And how do we overcome stigma at the prescription counter? Take it away. Yeah, these are all great questions. And I think if we could uh, solve these in a few minutes here today, um, someone would give us a, a, some sort of prize. Um, we definitely would fix a huge problem, but I think we can take some initial steps. Um, and there's certainly some things that uh, as pharmacists, we can be aware of in how we act and how we interact with patients and how we discuss different interventions uh, when we're talking with someone who either has a substance use disorder and is using maybe non-prescription opioids, or who is on uh, an opioid medication for chronic pain, uh, but happens to have risk factors uh, that increase their risk for an opioid overdose, whether that be uh, because they have COPD or they are on a concomitant benzodiazepine. Um, those are all reasons why uh, you would want to uh, make sure someone has access to resources that they would need to prevent an overdose. So a great example of how a pharmacist can approach a conversation with a patient to make sure that they're getting access to the resources that they need. Uh, the example I typically go to first is, is the example of chronic pain. Um, and so if you have a patient who's on oxycodone and they are also uh, diagnosed with COPD, and you want that patient to go home with naloxone to have available just in case, oftentimes those patients will be apprehensive to even have that conversation with you. They'll feel like you're judging them because you're telling them you want them to take naloxone home with them. Um, they'll think you're diagnosing them with a substance use disorder because you want them to take naloxone home with them. And we know from research that most of these patients don't recognize that naloxone can be helpful in circumstances outside of opioid misuse or non-prescription use. Uh, so I usually used to use the conversation of a seatbelt, right? You can drive, you can be the safest driver on the road. You can drive the speed limit. You can follow all the rules. It doesn't mean you're driving around without your seatbelt. You know that there are certain things that can increase risk. You know, maybe the other drivers around you, maybe the weather's bad. And so it's good to have a seatbelt there just in case something bad were to happen. Naloxone is the same thing. So we're identifying folks who may be more likely to need a seatbelt, and we're just making sure that they have that seatbelt available. 
And then as far as stigma with, with patients with substance use disorder, it's just really important that as pharmacists, we recognize um, that uh, folks out in the community and folks in our own profession don't always speak in appropriate terms or don't always consider this a disease. Uh, it is a disease, right? We know that there's changes in the levels of, of how dopamine's transmitted in the brain. We know those changes stay there for quite a long time, sometimes the rest of a patient's life, and they change how that patient perceives and uses drugs. So it's important that when we talk about this, we use patient first language. It's a patient with opioid use disorder. It's a patient with substance use disorder. It's not uh, colloquially someone who's an addict, right? We want to make sure we're using the appropriate terms. And just those small changes let our patients know that we're someone that they can trust and have these conversations with without feeling like they're being judged and can really make a huge step towards getting them to interact more frequently with the healthcare system. Okay, that's fantastic. Now, the another question is, what about us pharmacists overcoming stigma in the profession? Uh, I have brother uh, pharmacists, brother and sister pharmacists, who will say to me, I don't fill buprenorphine. I'm not dispensing naloxone because I'm not going to encourage that behavior. How do we kind of get and talk with those people that are in our profession that understand new uh, opioid receptors? Yeah, so I think it's important to recognize with regard to naloxone, right? Certainly naloxone is not a treatment for a disease. Um, and so we don't want to give the impression that giving naloxone is somehow going to change uh, someone's disease status. Uh, we also know there are most patients will not, but a few patients may use in a more risky manner if naloxone is available. But the vast majority of patients are going to use that drug, whether naloxone is available or not. And so, again, I, I, I like to give uh, analogies or stories that we can use. Uh, if someone's going to go out on a boat and that boat's sinking and we say, hey, you know, uh, there's a ship coming to save you, the buprenorphine, but it's going to take a little while to get that ship here. Do we want to give those folks this life vest to help keep them afloat until the ship's there to help them? Uh, most people are going to say, yeah, of course I want to give the person that life vest. That's what naloxone is, right? Naloxone is a way to help keep these folks alive uh, in the event of an emergency long enough that they do have a chance to go and get access to treatment. Because the reality is, is in a lot of communities, access to treatment takes a while. It's not there for them that day. And then as far as the buprenorphine goes, I think the really important thing is just to encourage folks to read the literature if they want to learn for themselves. And what you'll find is that a lot of patients are successful on buprenorphine. A lot of patients go back to living normal, productive lives on buprenorphine. We know that buprenorphine prevents and reduces deaths. And as a pharmacist, I can't imagine anything uh, uh, more consistent with the oath of the pharmacist than providing a medication that I know decreases deaths. Um, and I, I would think that I would be violating my oath as a pharmacist if I wasn't providing that medication. I couldn't agree with you more. And the analogy I say to my patients, and, and it's interesting you bring this up, every one of my uh, buprenorphine patients, when they come in, they immediately get on their first visit, I give them naloxone. Uh, sometimes Narcan, right. we've been doing a lot of Cloxado because there's a fair amount of fentanyl in the area. And, uh, but it's the chronic pain ones. You've keyed in on something. It's those chronic pain ones are the ones that are hesitant. And I, I tell them, I say, do you have a fire extinguisher in your kitchen? They say, well, yes. Yeah. I said, were you planning on burning down your kitchen? <laughs> no. I said, That's what this is. Okay, terrific. So yeah, stigma, definitely a challenge. Uh, that we have to take. Next one is the X waiver. This go, might get a little political. The X waiver uh, seems to be going the way of manual typewriters uh, for those of us with as much gray hair as I have. What challenges do you see with the X waiver kind of going away? Are all providers capable of prescribing and monitoring and uh, help us out with scope of practice? Should general surgeons, gynecologists, endocrinologists be able to do this without any training. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so the X waiver, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, was the requirement that was necessary for someone to prescribe buprenorphine uh, to treat substance use disorder. Um, interestingly enough, you don't need an X waiver to prescribe the uh, uh, opioids that can cause the substance use disorder. And I would argue the riskier medication, uh, there are higher risks for respiratory depression with oxycodone than there are with buprenorphine. Um, and yet we, we required a special license to prescribe buprenorphine. Um, so that has gone by the wayside. Um, and there is, in fact, a 
very extensive body of literature that has shown that folks outside of addiction medicine, primary care providers, OBGYNs, that can provide this care and do it just as well as folks in addiction medicine for simple, straightforward patients. We certainly know for higher risk patients, patients with other uh, comorbidities, maybe an alcohol use disorder or, or use of benzodiazepines, uh, maybe someone with a, a complicated history of severe depression and suicidal ideation, we know that those folks benefit from the additional resources available in an addiction medicine uh, setting. But the reality is, is in some communities, that setting is not available to them. Where I'm at in Binghamton, New York, we have really extensive services here, but you go one county over and there's nothing. Those patients often have to travel 45 minutes to an hour to our city to get the medication. So having uh, a, a primary care provider that can provide this for folks who have straightforward disease, uh, it's a really reasonable way to do it. And in fact, um, in states where uh, collaborative practice agreements allow for uh, pharmacists in the community to enter into collaborative practice with physicians, um, there is an opportunity for pharmacists to be leading this as well. Um, hot off the press about a week ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, there was a publication out of Rhode Island where pharmacists were providing the initial buprenorphine based on their assessment of the patient and phone consultation with an addiction medicine provider. And then they went on to provide care over the period of a month. And they actually found that patients that got randomized to the pharmacy were more likely to stay in treatment than patients who got randomized to the addiction medicine clinic. That might have to do with ease of access. It might have to do with how the pharmacist spoke with the patient. It's really unclear. It's a pilot study, but that's really amazing data to be able to show that pharmacists can actually play a huge role in helping patients be successful with treatment. I agree entirely. That was, that was quite the study too. And it was what, 12 pharmacists, I believe that, that were yeah, I believe it was something like 12 or 20 pharmacists, and it was six pharmacies, but only three ultimately provided in the pilot. Uh, eventually, they will provide all their data from all six pharmacies, and I'm interested to see how that goes. Yeah, I will too, because, you know, obviously, we're the drug experts, you know, but, yes. and, and this is, you know, I, I think as well, an opportunity. So you're you're in the camp of anybody that's interested in prescribing buprenorphine should be able to do it, yeah. much less like your OBGYN, your endocrinologist can prescribe an opioid like oxycodone. Yes, and I do think yeah. like pharmacists can be really helpful in this process with helping to get uh, providers comfortable because the reality is just because the X waiver went away doesn't mean that all of a sudden every primary care doctor or emergency medicine doctor or, or uh, PA or NP is comfortable prescribing mm -hmm. this medication. So it's really important that from a from a, a government level that training resources are provided, um, but also as pharmacists, we can help answer some of these questions or apprehensions that providers have to help them to understand exactly how uh, to dose these medications, who's appropriate, what are some risk factors, um, we can be the experts for them. Excellent, thank you. And then uh, here's the question. Uh, MOUD, Medications for Opioid Use Disorder, we used to call it MAT, uh, Medication Assisted Treatment, uh, buprenorphine versus buprenorphine and naloxone, suboxone versus subutex. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, I really don't think that there's that much of a difference. Um, I know that having the naloxone on board sometimes makes people feel warm and fuzzy because we're saying, oh, there's an, there's an abuse deterrent in there. And that's going to prevent, so it's going to help someone to make correct decisions because, you know, they can't use this inappropriately. Um, what we've learned with, with most, uh, you know, did, modified formulations, dosage formulations, is that folks find ways around this. If they're, if someone wants to misuse a medication, they're going to find a way to misuse a medication. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the important thing to know is the, the buprenorphine, regardless of formulation, is the active component. And most patients who are going out of their way to get buprenorphine are doing so because they are looking for treatment and because it is making them feel more normal. And it's because they want to stay on that long term. Are there folks out there who are going to misuse this? Absolutely. Are there folks out there who are going to sell their buprenorphine? Absolutely. But a, a, the majority of patients um, who go and seek out this medication are doing so because they want to treat their disease. And so regardless of which formulation you use, um, there's always going to be a little bit of abuse potential, but most folks are not looking to abuse buprenorphine. It doesn't give them the same high that they're going to get with fentanyl or heroin. And so they would much prefer to use that if they're looking to get high off the medication. My take on this is a little different. I always say that if you had a cereal bowl full of 
buprenorphine tablets, subutex, we can call them on the street. And I had them sitting out at a party. Would you take any? Neither would I. Exactly. Who's going to take it? Someone and, with. And, and honestly, the reality is if you talk to, you know, when I talk to patients about this, um, like I said, most patients will tell you that the, the feeling you have from buprenorphine is nothing compared to the feeling from heroin or fentanyl. So, so you're not seeking it out for, uh, you know, pleasure. And, and most of the time when folks are uh, selling their medication, they're selling it to folks who are looking to get treatment, but just can't get access to care. And so they're sort of supplementing or guiding their own therapy by buying this on the street because they can't find any other way to get it. Um, so, so it's exactly not really a popular... Point. Who are they diverting it to? <laughs> exactly. Very. I, and now the question is, can we get the FDA to believe this? Because, you know, I, I think the, the challenge is, you know, we get the wholesalers and, the you know, they get involved in this. You know, I would get calls from our wholesaler. Hey, we need your dispensing data. You're buying a lot of this. You're buying a lot of that. And it is. It's frustrating because this is going to help people that truly need it. Very good. Yeah. All right, let's get to the big one now, naloxone dispensing. This is something that uh, just me as a community pharmacist is very passionate about. Uh, I have a little, uh, on my chalkboard, I have marks on how many lives I've saved. I am up to uh, seven lives now that we've saved uh, so far, five in Fayette County, no, it's eight, and three in Altoona just the other day. So there's eight people have come in and said to me, I use that naloxone. I saved my neighbor. I saved that's my amazing. mother in a couple of cases. I keep track of it. And that's probably just a fraction of what we've done. If you come to my pharmacy because, um, and you're on something like uh, a buprenorphine, I'll say you still are in those social circles you know, that you might have somebody at risk, I want you to have it. And I've had patients that come in and they tell me, every time you fill my buprenorphine, I want a naloxone. And we've had no problem getting it paid for, you know, by the uh, managed care organizations, everything has gone real well. So the big question is, and this just came up uh, on 215, the FDA votes uh, following a day-long joint meeting of two FDA advisory panels to weigh a request by Emergence Biosolutions, the manufacturer of Narcan, to sell the product over the counter. The vote was 19 to nothing. Okay, uh, states without standing orders. Pennsylvania, we have a standing order. Uh, we just switched uh, prescribers. It was Dr. Wendy Brown. Now that we have a new governor, she's in charge now. So she wrote the standing orders on uh, January 17th. Do you think there should be quantity limits for naloxone? Uh, pharmacist reimbursement, should it be built in for counseling? Uh, and what's your favorite? And then we can All talk a little questions. bit about the potential OTC products. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, currently there's no states without standing orders. Uh, the standing orders look a little bit different from state to state. So sometimes there's more hoops to jump through. Sometimes you can't get a prescription for a second party, um, but there is access in every state currently. As you said, there was a recent vote and um, you know, folks who I've talked to who are more familiar with um, where this stands in the process anticipate a subsequent vote from the FDA next month. Um, and there's no reason to believe why they shouldn't have approval of the over-the-counter product as early as next month. Um, I don't think that this will, the one thing that this will change, I think, is that um, obviously it will allow people to go and purchase the naloxone, maybe without talking to the pharmacist, right? They may go and buy it and use self-checkout and never talk to you at all. And that's certainly a lost connection that may have been important. But I'm here to reassure you that even folks that do that are going to be able to use these products. They're very easy to use. I actually conducted a prospective study where we compared training to no training. And even without training, um, it was still close to like 90% of people that could give that nasal dose. It's so easy to do. Now, there's definitely value in those conversations, linking folks to resources, dealing with their apprehensions, talking about Good Samaritan laws. So I still encourage folks to always talk to the pharmacists. And then, of course, there are uh, will still be prescription available, um, which, you know, will be helpful as far as billing insurance, getting access, because um, that may not be the case for the over-the-counter products. Um, should there be quantity limits? I don't think so. Um, I think that, that you know, they're by they've talked about this previously in Ohio and other states, um, like three strikes laws. Uh, but 
as I said earlier, taking the safety net away doesn't mean someone's not going to still do the activity. So at the end of the day, you're just allowing harm to occur where there could be an intervention to save someone. Absolutely. Go ahead. Oh, I was just say as far as what's my favorite, you you uh, you said earlier. I uh, I mentioned something that that sort of was your hot button issue. This is my hot button issue with the FDA. Um, there is uh, no clinical reason why we need higher doses of naloxone. Um, so I will tell you from treating patients with fentanyl overdose that fentanyl responds to standard doses. Um, the four milligram intranasal dose has the same peak that we achieve with the zero point four milligram IV dose. The data that, that the FDA and companies are using to suggest that we need higher doses is all based on pre-hospital studies. And the one really important thing they don't report in those studies is the time from dose one to dose two. We know that it takes about three to five minutes for intranasal naloxone to work. We know that they're comparing reversal data from an era before intranasal existed to an era after intranasal existed. So EMS folks went from using IV, which works very fast, to using intranasal. So what is very likely the case is these folks gave the intranasal dose, waited one to two minutes, gave a second dose, and that was considered a treatment failure. So at the end of the day, do I think there's risk in giving someone Cloxato or Zimhi? They might have some more significant withdrawal symptoms. It might give them a little bit more apprehension to have naloxone the next time. So that's a potential, but we don't know that that's a, a, a hindrance at this point because these are new products. Um, so what I'll often say is that if it comes down to a cost issue, Narcan is just as good as Cloxato, and it's going to reverse the vast majority of cases. Uh, if someone's more comfortable with a, with an intramuscular device, certainly uh, uh, that does provide uh, the route for, through Zimhi. It's the only option there. Um, but the peaks that they're going to get with Cloxato and Zimhi, which are much higher than Narcan, have never been shown uh, uh, in any sort of uh, reliable way uh, to be necessary for reversing a typical opioid overdose with heroin or fentanyl. So twice as strong isn't twice as effective as what you're saying. Correct. All right. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And uh, one more thing I'd like you to address, because I went to pain week with my son-in-law, Mark Garofoli, and uh, I was talking about our standing orders in Pennsylvania. The guy said, got to be a little careful with that Narcan because of those Narcan parties. There's never been a documented one, has there? <laughs> you know, and so I, and yeah, I was saying I've been I've been working with uh, emergency overdose patients for the last almost ten years and doing research in substance use clinics for uh, the last three. I have never once in my life talked to a patient who has been to a Narcan party. Certainly, sometimes groups will make a responsible decision and they'll say, "Hey, there's six of us." And five of us are going to use today, and one of us is going to not use, and they're going to have naloxone available should something bad happen. And we encourage this. We don't want patients mm -hmm. to ever use alone. Um, we know that using alone increases the risk for fatal overdose. Um, and so certainly sometimes one person may not use for that morning or, what, or whatever instance, and they'll have naloxone available. But there are not parties where people are making, you know, I, I'm not going to say it never happens, because then when it happens once, uh, you know, the someone's going to point their finger and say, see, I told you. But it's not some common occurrence where folks are out there uh, having naloxone parties. Because what is a person that is using uh, heroin? What is their biggest fear? Are they using yeah. heroin to prevent from getting sick or are they trying to get high? Yeah. And, they don't want to get you know, sick. Do they exactly. want to take the chance of acute withdrawal from yeah. naloxone? No. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense at all. Wow, you've really cleared up a lot of stuff. I am so glad that uh, Grishel and Diane and everybody reached out to you. And I'm so glad you carved out some time out of, I know you got a really busy schedule to talk to us tonight. Thank Happy you to do it. so very much for your input. Yep, I even learned to, because I was a clock state guy, hey, twice as strong as gotta be twice as good. I appreciate that. And I thank you for it. No problem. So even us gray haired guys got a lot to learn. Too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Eggleston. We appreciate it. All right. That had to be one of the most outstanding interviews I've gotten to do. So uh, tell you a, a quick brief uh, visit that I had at my store. This happened uh, last Monday. Uh, older gentleman, uh, well, a, a dad came up to me. I, I'd say he was probably around 40 years old with his son. And he said, hey, doc, can I get some Narcan here? And I said, well, of course you can. What, you know, 
do you have insurance? Have you ever gotten anything here before thinking of running a prescription? He says, well, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to use my insurance. I says, well, what do you need it for? He said, oh, I'm in Boy Scouts. And he said, this is my son. He's a senior patrol leader. And we are going to the first aid meet. And they said, it would be a good idea for us to have Narcan in our first aid kit. Well, I've done Boy Scouts for 17 years, and I know what some of the uh, younger kids uh, goes through their mind. And so I said, I don't think you need to have Narcan in your kit. If we're looking for something for your first aid meet, I said, I can take care of you. Took them back to my office, and I gave them a Narcan demo kit that I had, which is just simply the little plunger thing, nothing in it. And I said to them, you know, this is what I think you should use. That way you don't have an active ingredient. With Boy Scouts, they don't want you to even have an oral Benadryl, acetaminophen, ibuprofen. They don't want or any oral meds in your first aid kit. I can't imagine that they really thought it would be a good idea for Narcan uh, because generally these first aid kits are taken, the first aid meets are taken out on troop outings. I did ask, does he have a kid in his troop that he would think would be at risk for an opioid overdose? He says, no, not at all. So gave him a demo unit. But what pleased me so much about it is even the Boy Scouts want to be educated about Narcan, be prepared. It's their motto. And I'm glad to see that uh, they're looking at uh, teaching kids uh, this uh, aspect of first aid. All right, it's time for our first question, our first assessment question. Which of the following diseases is caused by viruses that has the longest incubation period? Is it COVID, rubella, RSV or influenza, which one of those has the longest incubation period? Go ahead and key in your answer now. All right, let's see what answer you selected. Which of the following diseases? Uh, you picked rubella, very good. Rubella, remember we talked about mumps, measles, and rubella having the longest incubation period. Rubella has an incubation period of 12 to 23 days with an average of 17 days. The rest of the diseases have incubation periods of less than seven diseases. Very good. All right, so we've got more news to talk about. Naplex, which is for us older pharmacists, it's your boards, your board exams. Uh, this was prepared by the NABP, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, at the end of January. In 2022, 80% of the students that took the NAPLEX passed the exam, 80%. We could say it in a more negative way, and we will, 20% that took the exam failed it, okay? And the all-time pass rate for 2022, kids that took the exam a second or third time is 78%, okay? That's the NAPLEX news. I think that is very discouraging. Uh, I think back to 1981, when my wife Denise and I took our exam, I think we had one kid in the class fail and it's because her father had passed away. So I think it makes us have to think some. Is this because of the Zoom classes? Is it because of the number of students applying to pharmacy school? Uh, or is it the exam itself? Secondly is the MPJE, um, which is what we would refer to as the law exam. It's the multi-state pharmacy jurisprudence examination. And the news is even bad with that, even a little bit worse, actually. One out of four failed it. 76% uh, passed it uh, for the all-time pass rate and 77% passed it for the first-time pass rate in 2022. So I think we have a, a lot of thinking to do in this profession. Uh, I don't think these exam pass rates are really acceptable to anyone. I'm sure the deans of the pharmacy school are as frustrated as those of us who are waiting for this group of students to get licensed uh, so we can have uh, more staffing. So just for the heck of it, because I'm one of these fun guys, let's try an Aplex question, see what you think. Um, a 66 year old female with type two diabetes and history of MI comes in for a follow-up evaluation, reports taking a tormostat in 80 without any adverse effects. Her pertinent lab values are an A1C of 7.3, triglycerides 210, a little bit elevated. You want them less than 150, right? Uh, HDL is 40, LDL is 74, uh, 
I'm sorry, the triglyceride, the total cholesterol was 210. The trigs are 480 and you want them under 150 for your diabetes. So which of the following are we going to recommend to decrease her CVD risk? There is no place for you to answer this question. Just think about it in your head. Uh, what would you recommend for lowering the CVD risk because of the triglycerides being 480? Are we gonna use Vasipa, Lovaza, Niospan, or Tricor? Give it some thought. Okay, this is a typical Naplex question. So here's the right answer. The answer is Vasipa, Icosapen, uh, added to statin therapy in patients with moderately elevated triglycerides, demonstrated a reduction in composite CV death. You had to know the results of the Reduce It trial. Okay, Lavaza doesn't have any clinical trial evidence. Niospan, uh, the AIM High study, blew that one out of the water. And fibrates combined with statins have increased the risk for rhabdomyolysis, so we don't want to be using fibrates. Yeah, you have to know three different studies to get that question right. Let's try another question. A patient with uncontrolled blood pressure is given catapress despite being on antihypertensive medications, which is the following best describes the mechanism of action of catapress or clonidine. Uh, I'm surprised that in the Naplex they are using brand names. Uh, functions as an alpha-2 receptor agonist in the CNS, irreversibly inhibits P2Y12 component of the ADP receptor, inhibits reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine in the central nervous system, mainly inhibits reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft. Uh, of the CNS. So what's your answer to that? The mechanism of action question, how does clonidine work? Here's the answer. This one I think is a little bit more reasonable of a question. Okay, clonidine, uh, CAPE, or uh, catapress functions as an alpha-2 receptor agonist in the CNS, uh, decreased release of norepinephrine that causes relaxation of the blood vessels and lowers blood pressure. The other mechanism of action, the P2Y12 is Plavix. Uh, Desphenylflaxin is uh, selective uh, serotonin and norepinephrine uptake, reuptake inhibitors. I think we think of uh, Effexor probably being more commonly seen as well as uh, Cymbalta or Duloxetine. And uh, dexmethylphenidate or any amphetamine uh, inhibits reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft. That question seems to me to be a little bit more reasonable than the first one where you had to know three different studies. All right, this is one of our favorites for Achieve CE's news and views. One of our favorites, the prescription of the month. Is there anything wrong with this prescription? Let me tell you, it has a story to it. it says for Flumalast, 500 micrograms. Take one tablet daily. Anything wrong with it? No, there's nothing wrong with this prescription, but it's a great discussion point. Happened at my store, okay? The patient was taking Dally Rest brand, one tablet daily. He was out of refills, and he was down to his last five tablets, I believe, and requested a refill. So we sent for refills and the physician sent that prescription. So we filled it with Reflomalast because it's now available as a generic. So we fill it for Reflomalast one tablet daily. And this was the first time that the patient was given the generic. They thought it was a new drug and was taken both. So he comes to the pharmacy, says, I didn't get my Dally Resp yet. I'm out of it. I took the last one yesterday and you're not filling it. And I said, Oh, yeah, uh, we did fill it. We most certainly filled it. Uh, here's the date. And he said, no, I didn't pick it up. You know, so you're, you're in the pharmacy. You're going nuts looking for it. What happened? I said, let me print you out the label. I'm sure you have it. So I printed the label and took it over to him. And I said, it's this Roflum. It's Roflum last. He says, I was taking both of it. He says, I thought that was a new prescription that my COPD doctor ordered for me. Again, how important it is for patient consultation, even if the patient's been taking the medication for a while. So uh, I immediately went back, changed the label to say in parentheses after take one tablet daily, generic Dalaresp. Okay, latest from the FDA, new drug and device approvals. We've got a brand new drug. This is, I think, kind of exciting. Uh, stat which is Jezduvro. Wow, where they're getting these names, it amazes me too. Jezduvro is an oral 
hypoxia inducible factor prolyl hydrolase inhibitor and HIFPHI. Wow. For the treatment of patients with anemia from chronic kidney disease. We all know with chronic kidney disease that anemias do develop because of the kidneys inability to make erythropoietin. So over 700 million patients worldwide suffer from chronic kidney disease and an estimated one in seven have anemia that needs to be treated. More than half of the million adults, half a million adults in the United States have CKD that requires dialysis. So the oral treatment option for anemia due to chronic kidney disease is this new drug. Uh, it's available as oral tablets, one, two, four, six, and eight milligram tablets. So they take a tablet once a day. The results of the ascend -ND trial results showed that the protostat improved and or maintained hemoglobin within the target level of 10 to 11.5. For the hemoglobin level, and that's that's a normal hemoglobin level. That's one that we want to target to. So its mechanism of action is that hypoxia-inducible factor prolyl hydrolase domain factors are a relatively new class of orally administered drugs that stimulate red blood cell production. It's used in late stage global clinical development for treatment anemia of chronic kidney disease. This class of drugs, it's pretty cool how it works. Um, it activates the oxygen sensing pathway in our body. You know, when you're, you have receptors that aren't, that are sensing that you need oxygen and calls for more blood cells, more hemoglobin. So that's how this kind of works. It's, it works on those oxygen sensing pathways that maintains hemoglobin levels in patients with kidney disease, whether they're on dialysis or not. It may also, and this is really good news, it may also increase the total iron binding capacity, thus needing uh, reducing the need for iron supplementation. With most of the treatments that we have today, you have to supplement with iron. And we say, you know, you need the bricks and the mortar to build a wall. And so you do need iron supplementation, but with Jezdevroke, uh, because it increases iron binding capacity, you might not need iron supplementation. So will Jezdevroke replace EPO? Well, the FDA gave a box uh, warning highlighting the increased risk for blood clotting and complications, including death, a heart attack and stroke, as well as blood clots in the lungs, legs, or dialysis access site. Uh, so it, it got the infamous box warning. Uh, adverse effects, high blood pressure, thrombotic vascular events, abdominal pain, dizziness, and allergic reactions can all be attributed to Desdravroc therapy. Uh, do not use it if the patient has uncontrolled high blood pressure, and it's not approved for patients with chronic kidney disease who are not on dialysis. If they have anemia, but they're not on dialysis, they cannot get this drug. It also has some interactions with the CYP2C8 uh, inhibitors. A big one is gemfibrozil. Uh, unfortunately, we still are using a fair amount of gemfibrozil. If they're on clopidogrel or Plavix, reduce the dose by half and caution with Mondelucus and trimethoprim, as well as rifampin, which, as we know, is an inducer of uh, all the CYP enzymes. So let's review real quick uh, our erythropoiesis stimulating agents, the ESAs. We have Procrit and Epigen, and what's the difference between them? None. Uh, they're both made by Amgen, but Janssen markets uh, Procrit. And I have the strengths here that are available. The starting dose, whether it's IV or subcutaneous, um, is given either 50 to 100 units per kilogram three times a week. And that's a pretty good range, I know, but it's based on their response. Okay, so you're going to titrate to maintain a hematocrit of 36%. Uh, when approaching 36%, which is, you know, a target hematocrit, we want to reduce the dose. If it exceeds 36%, you're going to hold that dose till the hematocrit's lower. Then you're going to reinitiate at a lower dose. If the hematocrit increases more than four points in a two-week period, you got to decrease the dose. And then you want to monitor twice weekly for two to six weeks. If the hematocrit increases five or six, if the hematocrit increase of five or six point is not achieved and the iron stores are adequate, then you might need to bump up the dose some more. 
Uh, make sure you're watching your transferrin, which is you know how much iron is being held. If the transferrin saturation is less than 20%, then you need to supplement with iron. With Jezduvrac, you might not need that iron supplement. If the iron saturation is over 20, then you got to bump up your dose of EPO. So uh, these EPOs are pretty much the standard of care now for our dialysis patients with anemia. Uh, another one that we see used occasionally is Aranesp. And this is dosed not three times a week, but it's only dosed one time a week. And this has a, a, a multiple number of strengths of 25, 40, 60, 100, 150, 200, 300, and 500 available in vials and pre-filled syringe. It's given once a week, or if the patient's responding well, you might be able to do it every two weeks. And you start with 45 mics uh, if you're doing it once a week, or you can start with 0.75 mics if you're dosing it every two weeks. Uh, dosage adjustment, two to six weeks for uh, dosage adjustment because of the time required for erythropoiesis. If hemoglobin is increasing and approaches 12 grams per deciliter, you reduce the dose. Now remember for ARNS, we use hemoglobin. For Procrit and Epigen, we use hematocrit as our basis for determining the dose. I'd always tell my students, Procrit, hematocrit, crit, crit. Just remember it that way, it's easier. And then we use um, for the ARNS for darbopoietin, then we use that hemoglobin concentration like we do for the oral medication. Uh, treatment of anemia, we have the doses here uh, for hemoglobin, you wanna keep it less than 13.5 for males, less than 12 for females, and hematocrit less than 36. Okay, uh, this is your, is your anemia basis. Anything over those, then you're getting to the other end of the scale and you might need to reduce the dose. Okay, in controlled, Trials, patients experiencing uh, on these drugs saw a greater risk for death and cardiovascular reactions if they got over that 11 grams per deciliter. So if you hit 12, you definitely want to start backing it down. Uh, and the FDA in 2008 put a REMS on Procrit, Epigen, and ARNS because of the increase for death, and they pulled it back in 2017, uh, they eliminated the risk evaluation and mitigation strategy for epi epigen and procrit as well. So very interesting that they were very, very cautious in 2008, but then they rolled it back once they saw that they really weren't having problems with stroke as well as cardiovascular events as and heart attacks. All right, let's take our final assessment question. How often is the drug darbopoietin administered? Is it orally, once a day, IV, once a day, SC, once a week, or orally, three times a week? How often do we give darbopoietin, alpha, or ARNS? Go ahead, key in your answer, and I'll give you about 15 seconds to do that. All right, let's see what answer our class selected. How often are we doing it? Uh, subcutaneous once we go oh, you almost all got it. Fantastic. You guys are really paying attention well. Congratulations. Well done, class. Uh, the answer is subcutaneous once a week. It's administered either IV or sub Q once a week. And in some cases, we can go every other week. Okay, editorial on pharmacy trends. Let's see what Professor Pete has to say. Oh, I'm really concerned, and I'm sure many of you in the audience are, about those NAPLEX scores as well as the uh, law exam scores being down so low. What's the cause? Less students. Well, we know that the pharmacy school enrollments are down. Uh, kids applying to pharmacy schools are down by 40%. That's no secret at all. Uh, is it a problem with the quality of the students entering the professions? Are we accepting kids into schools of pharmacy that maybe 30, 40 years ago would not have been accepted into pharmacy school? Uh, are we uh, seeing more competition with, I think the physician assistant schools are probably our major competition. A lot of kids 
want to go to PA schools. Matter of fact, one of my students back when I was in Altoona, she was a high school kid. She came and to work with me. And she says, I don't know if I want to do pharmacy school or PA school. And she worked with me for the whole year. And it, after about three months, she says, I'm going to PA school. She applied to St. Francis and she still had Mr. Crackle as her teacher. She really excelled and she was one of my better students because of the exposure she had in the pharmacy, working community pharmacy. But I think that it is something that we are all extremely concerned about is the uh, number of students as well as the quality of students. And let's be realistic, there's less kids around. Uh, you know, the neighborhood that uh, we live in here there's just not a lot of kids. The neighborhood we lived in in Tyron, there weren't a lot of kids. There's just less kids today. You know, uh, my wife's family, there was Diana, Denise, Donna, Danelle, Doreen, and David. She had six in her family. We had Paul, Don, Pete, and Mary in ours. And we had three kids. And people looked at Denise when she was pregnant for the third time, like maybe you guys ought to get cable TV or something. All right, so let's take a look at your questions. I, I need to, I want to get some uh, interaction with you. Uh, we have the five-digit code, which we will post at the end. Um, so feel free to uh, to tell us what are your thoughts about the profession. What do you? What direction do you see uh, us going in? Should we make smaller class sizes? Um, is there a pharmacist shortage, or is there a shortage of pharmacists who want to practice community pharmacy? Uh, my daughter Gretchen went to. Uh, one of the local, well, let's say it, it was Target. She went to Target the other day because, you know, my grandson Luke must have seen a uh, a Lego that he didn't have. And uh, she went back to the pharmacy and it was closed. There was a sign on, you know, due to lack of staffing, um, our pharmacy is closed for today. Uh, please, you know, go to another uh, one of our stores and they, they would give an address. Uh, that's absolutely unheard of because where we live is Morgantown, West Virginia, where West Virginia University School of Pharmacy is. You know, at one time, everybody wanted to work in Morgantown. Like when I was in pharmacy school, everybody wanted to work in Pittsburgh. So what is going on that we have uh, lots and lots of uh, less kids that are interested? Go ahead and type in the chat box. I want to hear what your thoughts are uh, on the status of the profession. And are you having staffing issues in your area? Uh, are you seeing that uh, less kids are graduating from pharmacy school? And are you struggling to fill slots? Because uh, if you know where there's an abundance of pharmacists, uh, I, I can lead you in. The uh, town that we used to practice in up in Altoona, uh, one of the chains is offering a $75,000 sign-on bonus and nobody's taken it. And it's in Altoona, PA, and it's a small little um, it's a small city. You know, there's about uh, 45,000 people in it. So this isn't just rural America that's struggling with staffing. I think everybody is struggling. All right. Well, I see that it is eight o'clock and uh, we've had just an incredible discussion. Uh, somebody says, definitely seeing staff shortages at our competitors. And most of the people I know, don't think pharmacy school is worth the pay, customer issues and the scheduling. Uh, I think you're onto something, Stephanie. You know, if you're going to go to school for six years, is this really a profession that you want to enter into for 40 years? Dorothy says a lot of chains seem to have a heavy workload. They certainly do. And I think the, the fewer pharmacists that we have in those chains, the heavier the workload is going to be. For those practicing, can you imagine shutting down your pharmacy for one day? What happens the next day when you come to school or come to come to uh, work? You're going to be buried. I have this saying like on Memorial Day, you know, when we're off on Monday, I'll say we didn't get a day off. We get one less day to do a week's worth of work. You're still going to do your, you know, 1500 prescriptions in one week. You're just going to have one less day to do it. I don't know how um, long they think they can maintain that. So thank you for chiming in on that. Really appreciate your comments. All right, it's eight o'clock. Thank you so much for joining me for Achieve CE News and Views every Wednesday from seven until eight o'clock. There's a lot of places you can get continuing education and we're so glad you chose Achieve CE. Thank you so much for joining me and we'll be back again in another month. Good night.